Right, person-centered care, balancing patients and clinician welfare, which is actually the title that the publisher of my book to be has given me. Um, I had a much less interesting title. They decided it should be called something like this. Um, now I've said to a couple of people that I've gotten to know quite well, you know, if I go wrong here, if you think I'm making mistakes in terms of my logic, my reasoning, please do tell me because I'm committing to writing a book. They've given me a, a contract. I'd rather my friends and my colleagues told me now than down the track. So um, this is sort of emergent ideas developing. Uh, please um, let me know what you think. It's really just an elaboration of some of the ideas that I spoke to yesterday. So I want to look really at how the principle of moral equality underpins person-centered healthcare and has implications for balancing the wellness of patients, clinicians, and others. And I want to begin with a story about a woman called Kim who was left waiting for emergency care for almost an hour on a UK uh, National Health Service emergency helpline in 2013. Uh, this is a true story, although the picture is not of the real Kim. This was the headline in the Daily Mail. Um, it basically chastised doctors for not putting patients' interests before their own. However, the criticism in the Daily Mail implies the validity of the principle of primacy of patient welfare, a principle that requires doctors to put the interests of patients first. Selfless giving, and I use that word selfless intentionally rather than altruism, but selfless giving to patients is expected, indeed obligated professionally, of doctors. Key reasons are that patients have greater health needs than doctors. Health care, health, health care is a human right in international law and doctors are paid within a service contract to implement this right. However, the principle of primacy of patient welfare has seldom been debated. Its truth has been taken for granted, although its visibility has sometimes dimmed. The 2002 Charter for Medical Professionalism therefore reasserted the principle which has been perceived to be under threat from modern forces. These forces include changes in healthcare delivery that limit doctors' power to implement the right of individual patients to healthcare while pursuing group rights for social justice. Yet concerns about the principle of patient primacy bubble away for doctors to put the health of the present patient first can devalue doctors' own moral interests, such as personal wellness or even retirement. It can lead to doctor burnout and to moral blindness to its effects on healthcare delivery. It can stifle doctors' self-development. If doctors put their own patients first all the time, they wouldn't be able to come to conferences such as this one. It can patronise patients, who is exemplified by conditions such as Parkinson's disease, may resist the categorisation of patienthood. It can contradict other moral principles, such as justice, and it uses inequality to put patients first, since positive discrimination is still discrimination. Indeed, many claims on medical practice compete with selfless duty to patients. For example, in the Journal of Medical Ethics, Dr. David Wendler documented 27 exceptions to doctors acting in the best interests of the present patient. These exceptions include societal interests, doctor interests, and the values of patients and their families. My response is that person-centred care resolves the problem because it moves us from the principle of primacy of patient welfare to the principle of moral equality. 
the principle of moral equality considers equally the equal moral interests of all people, including doctors and patients. Protecting the welfare and other equal moral interests of patients and doctors, for example, by limiting doctors' hours of work, has, as far as I can see, two justifications in ethics. First, it's morally important for its own sake. Patients and doctors are both people, and every person is of equal inherent worth, which entitles them to equal respect. Secondly, the principle of moral equality has instrumental, not merely intrinsic importance. Protecting the moral interests of doctors, for example, also minimises harm to patients. However, there is no code of rules or principles to provide a decision procedure for determining how to apply situationally the principle of moral equality. This is a problem because people need guidance on how to apply this egalitarian conception of person-centred care in their own circumstances. Turn my page over. So I wish to suggest that guidance in recognising and choosing among competing moral interests can be found in the conjunction of virtue ethics and situationism. The intersection, I suppose, is situational virtue ethics, situational virtue. Virtue ethics tells us what is important is the character of the person making and enacting decisions. Key virtues of character, which respect the dignity of personhood and the principle of moral equality, include practical wisdom for an ethos, humaneness and justice. In terms of justice, for example, I like the difference principle, according to which even the people whose interests are least satisfied should still fare, fare well. Indeed, these people may be better off than they were before. However, the virtues are extremely difficult for any person to develop and apply consistently in the real world. And that's where situationism comes in. It seems to me that we need to produce environments and social institutions that are situationally conducive to the development of virtue and to virtuous action upon equal consideration of equal interests. So. <laughs> so let me clarify these ideas by way of a concrete example. Before a doctor puts their own interests first and, for example, takes a holiday, structural arrangements must be set in place to facilitate the exercise of virtue and help keep the patient safe. Such arrangements can be achieved here because, for example, locum care is typically available. Moreover, the usual doctor is likely to return refreshed. If patient safety cannot be protected, it cannot be of the doctor, of, it cannot be in the moral interest of the doctor to ignore it. In the context of these structural arrangements, the construction of safe and other virtuous acts depends on virtuous discourse. Interesting that Andrew yesterday talked about discourse. Since as Aristotle said in the Nicomachean Ethics, man is a political and social animal. By virtuous discourse, I mean deliberative dialogue whose purpose is to enable people with moral interests according to their capabilities to participate freely and virtuously in decision-making together as equal citizens. Deliberative dialogue has two stages. First, dialogue is needed to elucidate and specify moral interests through authentic inquiry, discovery and advocacy. And then deliberation, which I suggest is another word for the lexicon, is needed to debate and adjudicate between competing moral interests on the basis of good and sufficient reasons. This deliberation is needed to make binding 
decisions that can bridge differences between groups, achieve mutual safety, and ideally maximise overall welfare. So in our out of hours care example, which I introduced, introduced at the beginning, it is incumbent on the system to enable doctors with patients and others to decide when they can safely choose to provide out of hours care or not. Agreement, therefore, will depend on doctors and others, including patients working together. Cooperation, open-mindedness and practical wisdom are each needed to resolve areas of uncertainty and difference and build on common ground for the shared benefit of patients and doctors. And that's all I just wanted to say. Our challenge, of course, is to make that happen. Thank you. For one more beautiful lecture, it's, it's a pleasure to listen to your arguments, and I think your book is going to become a good book. <laughs> Let us just move uh, immediately to the second entry, and that's another old-timer who's been on stage before, and that is Josi Stoyanov. Uh, where? Ah, yes, <laughs> there you are. So let, let me thank... Uh, the Society for inviting me to, to deliver this lecture, uh, which results from over five years of uh, conceptual and empirical effort to deliver an explanatory model of burnout syndrome in healthcare personnel. Our preliminary hypothesis was based that there is something wrong with the context and the identity of the healthcare employees which is more specific to this kind of organizations than to the other vulnerable populations. In current literature, you, you can discover so many claims from so many different professional backgrounds that they are affected with burnout, that uh, practically that there is nothing, uh, nothing but probably uh, bus drivers or taxi drivers who may not claim that they are affected by burnout. So each of those populations and subpopulations is characterized by some kind of specific interrelations or specific model which is characteristic for the working environment, for the relationships, the social activities, traits, and self-representation in the particular vulnerable group. Frankly speaking, uh, I'm not seeing here uh, Joachim, but my inspiration to go to, to this kind of research was also a personal crisis. Uh, and we have discussed this with Andrew last year, that uh, in academia as well as in healthcare, unfortunately, uh, mobbing is uh, a common practice. So uh, I was a victim of mobbing twice. And I, I thought that there is something wrong with my affiliation and belonging to the organization until one of those mobbings, the, the, the author who afflicted me, uh, actually attacked another person in the same organization a couple of weeks thereafter. So I thought probably if this is a replicated model of behavior that th this is not only me who is somehow inadaptive or uh, decontextualized, but probably something is going wrong with defining the roles, providing the self-image, which can deliver the formal affiliation in the informal belonging of the person to its working environment, which is actually the context for individual behavior. You cannot uh, disentangle the, the person from its context. They are functioning conjointly and they deliver conjointly results or they fail to deliver those results conjointly. Therefore, we thought that the trigger to burnout may be the failure to find protection within the group, the organization or the professional setting which impairs the self-esteem of the person and makes him adopt dysfunctional models of behavior. 
in order to implement a model of stress diathesis, so you have diathesis, which is the personal structure, or personality structure in terms of psychology, and then you have the context, uh, the environment should be described uh, like a uh, psychological climate of the working environment. What, is, what was critical for us was to define a stage model of burnout so that a prevention may be justified on an earlier stage of development of this uh, phenomenon. So we adopted this model, which says that we have a flame-out stage which is precipitating anxiety and depression on a very initial stage before the person is burned out. And there is a rust out, which is a final stage of burning, which is practically irreversible. So an intervention, normally, should be conceived here, before the burnout emerges. To summarize our working hypothesis that has been tested, uh, this is described in our first publication with Robert Cloninger in 2011, there is an interaction of three domains to determine vulnerability and to enhance burnout as organizational and personal phenomenon. On one hand, you have a profile of personal vulnerability. You need to select a proper tool to describe that profile of vulnerability. So did we. Then you have anomaly of the psychological climate, which should be complementary to those personality traits which have been described in the vulnerability profile. And then you have the burnout, which is further facilitating, enhancing the process of vulnerability. So if uh, one is vulnerable and working in an inappropriate environment, then he can easily get burnout and this process is uh, self, uh, self supported or uh, self protected. Uh, it's a kind of positive feedback. Let me to just justify this model with two examples. Imagine you are a persistent person and you work in an environment where autonomy is law, which is the environment in healthcare and in academia to a great extent. Say, so, you are persistent and you are frustrated with the low autonomy or low innovation. And therefore, you cannot realize and accomplish your personal potential and you got burned out. On the other hand, if you are persistent and you work in marketing or in some other environment, when your informal initiative is deeply encouraged, it is the thing that the management demands from you, then your persistence is appreciated and you feel well. So these two, the psychological climate dimension called autonomy or innovation, and your personal profile, the fact that you are persistent as a trait profile, they interact as a couple together to get the product you either flame out or you don't. And the uh, objective of this study uh, is actually uh, entailed from the example I gave you. Uh, it is to uh, profile the individual vulnerability through personality and psychological climate dimensions. We selected those tools to determine the different facets of our model. One was temperament and character inventory, revised in 2004. The other was psychological climate inventory by Kois and Decotis. And the standard measure for burnout, it is mass-like burnout inventory. Our initial pool was composed of 35 subjects. Then it was expanded to 302. And currently it is expanded to 500. Professionals employed in psychiatry, oncology, emergency, palliative care, general practice, and social care workers. Relevant validation procedures of the investigation tools have been performed. These are the summarized tables 
for the main measures of v validity in, in uh, psychometrics, the Kronbach alpha and the correlation coefficient by Spearman. Just uh, for, for those of you who have no psychological background, uh, the, the Kronbach coefficient should be range about 8, between 7 and 8. So we, we do have the 8 for the overall scales. There is just one low measure which needed revision. Uh, so were the results for the character scales. The first slide uh, was uh, the temperament scale summary. Then this is the Kronbach alpha result for the psychological climate inventory and for the mass lock burnout inventory. As you can see, it ranges between seven and eight. Then a field study has been performed, which proved at least two profiles responsible for the vulnerability of healthcare personnel to burnout in specific settings of the psychological climate. Those are highlighted uh, here on this table, this is the initial pool of 33 subjects uh, and uh, you can see the Spearman analysis uh, has confirmed that harm avoidance as a personality temperament trait in combination with pressure in psychological climate leads to emotional exhaustion. What does this mean? This implies that if you are harm avoidant, this, uh, that you are careful, that you are um, not self-sufficient, you, you, you are trying to protect yourself from stressful, risky initiatives, from any kind of exposure to, to challenges and so forth. And if you are constantly under pressure from the organizational management to do things in short terms, to do them swiftly, to persist for certain results in certain terms, then you can easily burn out. Low recognition and support from uh, the psychological climate do contribute uh, to the emotional exhaustion as they mention of burnout. Also, persistence, the personality character, uh, temperament trait I have mentioned in my example have been proven to correlate with emotional exhaustion uh, in, in burnout. This means that the more you are persistent, the more you are exposed to be burned out when your persistence isn't encouraged. And now is the good news, and it is that we have resilience model and resilience uh, or protective uh, uh, personality profile. And it is described with high self-directedness, which is negatively correlated. Uh, you, you can see it there. It is minus. It is minus. It is negatively correlated with uh, the emotional exhaustion and personal accomplishment a personal accomplishment is another dimension. It's a positive dimension of burnout. Uh, whenever autonomy in the psychological climate is high. Therefore, you are self-directed. You are self-sufficient in some, some way. You, you are ambitious. You are trying to develop yourself within the context and the context provides you with autonomy to do so. This is a potential protective factor for higher personal accomplishment and lower emotional exhaustion. The second protective profile is related to cooperativeness, uh, which is a character trait, but it needs to be related to cohesion. If you are cooperative, it is not self-sufficient prerequisite to be protected against burning out. You need to function in a psychological climate of cohesion, trust, and fairness. Respectively, low team cohesion determines high depersonalization as dimension of burnout. 
This data analysis is in a sample of 35. It has been explicitly confirmed in the sample of 302. To summarize the profiles I have already described empirically, this is the profile of vulnerability, proneness to burnout, and to your right is the resilience. The proneness is related to higher harm avoidance, pressure, low autonomy, high persistence, which eventually lead to emotional exhaustion. Low personal accomplishment is related to the factors of high persistence and low autonomy. And the resilience combinations are described on the right. The personal accomplishment is correlated with autonomy. The low emotional exhaustion is related also to autonomy and depersonalization to cohesion. The psychological climate neutralizes our personal accomplishment which are related to emotional exhaustion and independent indicators for resilience are self-directedness, cohesion, and fairness in psychological climate. These are rather sophisticated models, I presume. I'm, I'm very short in time already, so I, I will not get into details of these uh, models as we have recently published a book which I will advertised to you in the end of this presentation, but imagine that this is the regression factor analysis and modeling of how norms of organizational structure and reward and control mechanisms of personality do interrelate to determine different profiles of vulnerability and of resilience. Uh, the, the first slide described uh, the emotional exhaustion, this is the depersonalization according to the Maslach model of burnout, and this is the personal ac accomplishment uh, and uh, its determinants. The interconnected dimensions elicited belonging here are cooperativeness and self-transcendence, cohesion and fairness in psychological climate, and depersonalization as measurement of burnout. And this would be the book I have already mentioned. Uh, it, it must have been published a couple of days ago in Helborg, in Denmark. It's forwarded by Claude Robert Cloninger, the advisor of this project, and it describes our new model of burnout syndrome towards early diagnosis and prevention. And uh, as uh, you may remember, yesterday I have pressured very much all speakers to keep to schedule. So uh, I myself should serve as an example, therefore, of uh, a speaker who is not challenging the schedule. And I believe that what we can do from here is to establish collaborative network with uh, the colleagues uh, uh, which are attending at this session uh, to uh, justify and to test this model in uh, different cultural and social backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful lecture and for being a, such a good role model for us, both on keeping on time, but also demonstrating how you can use your own experience in a creative and scientific manner. I think we are so afraid of personal experience in medicine and the healthcare mm. system that we are getting Indeed. blind to what it can actually uh, yes, do one, for us yeah. in a good oh, legal environment where we, <laughs> where we keep each that. other on Sorry. track. Uh, I think that's one of the things I got after this. And I, now Elizabeth Davis is getting ready. Uh, could you please introduce yourself, Elizabeth? I know you come from London and it has to do with cancer, but perhaps in a few oh, words, tell the audience. I was hoping to avoid that. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> well, I <laughs> right. Um, I'm a public health doctor, an academic public health doctor, and I work at King's College London in the Division of Cancer Studies. Um, what I'm going to present is something very different um, uh, from my normal presentation about cancer epidemiology or patient experience, so um, I hope you can bear with me. Um, we'll step down again so we can appreciate yes. your lecture. <laughs> that is better. Okay, um, thank you. 
I was first tempted to collect together these tales ten years ago when friends and colleagues seemed to rather like some short pieces that I had written um, about my medical training and which were published in the British Medical Journal and elsewhere. And secretly, I realised I'd actually enjoyed writing these much more than the research articles I was supposed to be finishing at the time. There was no need to obsess over method or reference references, simply to try to describe what I had seen, heard and felt. I was coming to the end of a 20-year medical apprenticeship in the English NHS, and I'd been lucky enough to have an unusual route around it. But some of these experiences remained puzzling, and I wanted to try and put them together to see how they looked. So I must first of all ask your indulgence for what is a very personal English, parochial, and slightly historical view. But I hope that it does pick up on some of the things that we've been hearing about today and yesterday. So um, it all began in the 1980s when I took a year out of my medical training to uh, study for a master's in medical sociology and after a seminar on professional socialization one of the other students pointed out that I was in an ideal opportunity to study how students became doctors. Um, and I did manage to keep a detailed diary for, for the most part uh, of a year, but I realised that the aim of a medical school is to fashion a native doctor and not to support a visiting sociologist, and inevitably these field notes tailed off. Um, but I continued to write down things that moved me, um, and much later when I began to organise this, I found other memories came bubbling up as if it were each one for itself and what I've been doing is organising these into different time periods and I'm going to try and draw out uh, with a few of these tales the three main uh, themes. First of all though, um, this, this picture, it is said that every picture tells a story and each one of us has a novel in us and this is a picture that was used in the WHO report for uh, palliative care for older people. Um, and the very f I want to use it just to illustrate the very first thing that medical students, uh, clinical medical students, need to learn, which is how to see the right story and how to take a history, first of all, and to understand symptoms, to put those symptoms together to make the right diagnosis from which action follows they do feel a tremendous amount of anxiety about ever understanding all the symptoms that they need to ask about and to elicit them and put them together correctly. And they also, uh, or did, need to learn to steer the patient away from their own narrative, from the patient's own novel, because of the time that they have to uh, get through. So if you look at a picture like this, the, the medical history, as I was taught it, would concentrate on the right-sided uh, weakness that this 92-year-old uh, lady suffers from, and uh, which came on a, uh, a, a week ago, and the fluent dysphasia. It would observe that she had a history of atrial fibrillation that related to rheumatic heart disease she suffered as a child. And the student or the medical gaze may not even see the smile at the birth of a very late grandchild nor understand the anxiety she felt at its birth which related to a premature birth of her own twins many many years before nor see the delight of the nursing staff or her family that she survived for this picture. Um, so, um, the strict focus of the medical history, as it was taught to me some time ago, I think is one of the first things that pushes out the possibility of empathy with the individual suffering and disability that, of course, is the daily life of many doctors. I found myself in my medical training struck by the stories that patients told me, but the harder 
I found, that, 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 that when I tried to put what we called the social history then into the medical history, I found the harder of my uh, teachers telling me that I was writing English essays and not uh, presenting medical histories. Um, and it wasn't until I was interviewing patients for research many years ago, many years later, that I was able to put the patient back into the story as Oliver Sacks um, had done some time before. So the first tale um, that I'm going to tell you is called The Devil in the Test Tube, which describes a quite remarkable man. He was thin and weak, and his voice was almost inaudible, despite the relative quiet of a teaching hospital side room. By the time I joined the firm as a, as a student, he'd endured a fever of unknown origin for over a month, allocating him to me the house officer has ex had explained that his diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia should have been curable were it not that the source of this fever remained stubbornly elusive. Instead, he lay drained, submitting to repeated blood cultures and increasingly invasive investigations. After retiring as a schoolmaster, he had trained as a missionary and travelled widely. All manner of <coughs> latent in exotic infections might be coming back to haunt him, but all the tests came back negative. Finding a good vein for the blood tests became difficult, and I tried optimistically to explain each new investigation. We exhausted this bit of game playing after a while, and we moved on to the new direction in his work. Being single and used to teaching boys, I sensed he found the attention of a female student novel and he, of him applying his mind to me, summing up my performance and potential. He lived far from London and he had few visitors, which may have been a mixed blessing. He recounted the visit of one of his younger, more evangelical colleagues. Do you know, he suggested, that the devil may be here somewhere in my illness. And with sardonic glee, he recall, re recalled his response. Well, if the devil is here, he's at the bottom of a test tube now. But it was an effort for him to talk, his voice so low that I could not always catch what he said. And sometimes he would collapse back on the bed, trying to hide his exasperation. Once he did ask, are you sure your hearing is all right? Oh yes, I replied, my friends sometimes ask, but my GP says I should pay more attention. The weeks passed and so did Christmas, though no positive results arrived. He was weaker, his pyjamas flapped around him and his watch was broken. On the morning of Christmas Eve, he gave me money to buy a replacement. So overwhelmed was he by the structure this brought back to his days, he offered me money as a present. No, I said, buy me a book on theology when you are better. In the new year, I moved on to another firm and visited him less often, but I learned from the house officer that someone had reviewed his original bone marrow aspirate, and this had revealed atypical mycobacteria. I found my patient cheerfully contemplating the diagnostic puzzle. Isn't it interesting, he mused. It was there all the time. We just couldn't see it. He started receiving treatment and my visits dropped off. Some six months later, I met him by chance in the outpatient. Stronger, upright, and sporting a beard. I was so surprised, my words came out unchecked. What's happened to you? I asked. I've got better, he pronounced, lifting his stick and heading off to his appointment. I fight, quite forgot to report that he had prompted me to go back to my general practitioner and ask for some hearing tests, and these had revealed a low-frequency hearing loss. Weak patients and mumbling consultants are simply outside my range. I never did get the book on theology, but two devils had indeed been found out. And what I, I hope that this conveys is the importance and the necessity of spending that much more time uh, with patients because you learn not only about them, you learn more about the diseases 
they suffer from. And you can learn and often do a lot about yourself. But I'm not going to pretend that this is an easy thing. It's p potentially far easier as a medical student. But in a busy clinical practice, it requires a mastery of both the social and of the clinical spheres. And senior clinicians told me then and since that it's something that perhaps happens later in life when you can move between these two perspectives. And one said to me um, that he actually became more interested in the people he saw than the diseases they suffer. I think another aspect is, as we get older, that we see the impact of severe illness on people close to us. And um, my next uh, tale is a less happy one, but about the issue of our own mortality that most of us, if we're conscious, need to um, face. And this one is called, What a Rotten Job You've Got. He was a large man with gynecomastia, and he was covered in bruises. The day before, his general practitioner had sent him up to hospital for a full blood count. The phlebotomist he saw had taken a, uh, a enough blood for a clotting scan, and this had revealed disseminated intravascular coagulation. He'd been admitted urgently to the ward, on which I was a house officer. There, my efforts to obtain further blood were failing, as each vein I tried burst and bled into his skin. I sweated, he contained his irritation, and finally there were a few more millimetres. With some relief, I stood near the door, talking in general terms about further tests. What do you think's the cause of all this blood not clotting then? He asked. He'd been diagnosed 17 years before with prostate cancer, and had taken silbesterol long term, but I did not know what, if anything, he knew about the implications of this new development. His directness caught me off guard. I don't know. Sometimes it can be um, an after effect of the um, prostate. He frowned, looking as if he were trying to make sense of me. I made a polite escape. The next day, I apologised to my consultant for the small blood sample. Don't worry, she said, as we walked to the patient's room. His bone marrow is stuffed with malignancy. There's nothing we can do. He could bleed suddenly or last several weeks. I'm going to tell him now. She sat down to tell him that he was dying, and I busied myself on the ward. Afterwards, a ward nurse, wincing in the direction of his room, asked me to write up some pain control. Hesitating, I went into his room. I'll not stay if you don't want me to. No, I said, he said gratefully. I'd like to talk. I've been waiting 17 years for this, and I sort of knew when you said last night. I knew what you were trying to do, to let me down gently. I sort of knew anyway. He turned away, and looking out of the window, he added, God, what a rotten job you've got. I stared at him as he looked out into the watery sunlight of that winter day. I had no idea what I had been trying to do, and I wondered at his equanimity. He turned back. It's my wife I worry about. I just don't know how she's going to react. She could go to pieces, and she's losing her job soon. I feel uneasy about going home too. Of course, there are these new places, hospices, that might be a thing to consider, and there he faltered. Within those few minutes, he had taken on board his diagnosis, his prognosis, and he had begun thinking in practical terms. I realised then that I was out of my depths, and that my training had not <coughs> prepared me to know what to do. After he died, I rather dutifully took out some books from the library on communication with the dying, but as a house officer, I did not have the time to read them. It was only later, interviewing patients with cancer for research, that my thoughts turned back to the clear-sightedness of this man. He showed me 
that some patients can face more than we can as doctors and see the truth before us. They can also feel sympathy for us as we struggle behind. Um, so my generation received minimal training in breaking bad news, despite the fact that it's obviously a core facet of practice, and I think that this is much, much improved now. But I, but I, but I also think that um, we need to remember that it demands a great deal of young people who are many only in their early 20s. Okay, I need to speed up a bit. My, the second theme to, um, that I uh, identify is the privilege of medical practice in all its triumph and failure. Um, as I've said, it's often possible to help simply by talking and by listening. Listening is something that we, many people, talked about yesterday. And many of my teachers demonstrated great empathy there in front of us as students, but others did not. And I think the problem that has been uh, alluded to already is that, it's, it, that this, demonst this demonstration of empathy needs to be, was not, but needs to be institutionalized. I think if it isn't, there's always a risk of getting onto your white horse and becoming very busy and important, and sometimes becoming immune for various reasons to suffering. The, the last tale I'm going to tell before a bit of summing up um, is, shows what can happen when people feel that their own perspective and suffering is being ignored, and it's called a nanny's stamina. When I started as a house officer on the ward, she was practically mute. The effort of speaking was immense, and she could give none of the usual organisational cues. It was difficult to maintain for long such a one-sided encounter. She sat on the ward throughout the day, eschewing the group activities. I just can't do anything, she would manage. Later, she recalled how she felt the predicament of others trying to draw her out. But when I asked her what her attendants should do in that situation, she replied, you can't. There's nothing anyone can do. When someone's like that, you just have to leave them. Nonetheless, I went every day to see her, asking her how she was, and taking blood to check the levels of her various antidepressants. She disliked taking the tablets, and we kept increasing them. She acquiesced to this with that sense of having to suffer fools gladly that only the Scots can truly master. And of course, she was right. And we tipped her later into mania, embarrassing her greatly by the things she then said. To begin with, as the drugs began to take effect, she be fretted about her hair, and which by then needed washing, and the time she needed to get ready in the morning. But then, majestic in intricate cardigans, she emerged, and as she did so with her knitting, she told part of her story, or at least that part of her story where she had been in control. The notes gave a long history of her manic depressive illness and described her as an ex-nanny. Feeling at the time I was having more than my fair share of nanny troubles, I was interested in her as a relic from a time when nannies seemed to have been real nannies. This encouraged her. She spoke of coming down from Scotland to the south coast um, with her employers to look after four children. She described the large house, the trimmed hedge, her uniform, and the mother who dressed elegantly to receive friends for lunch. She recounted her one day off each week, the long hours, the evenings spent starching and pressing the children's clothes. Of course, she had an under nanny to help her with this, but she intimated young girls these days didn't know their luck. From my experience, I tended to agree, but this domestic scene was then shattered. One day in the household, she had been unwell with a fever heralding pneumonia. The mother, pregnant with her fifth child, had visited the nursery and the children had complained, that had, had, had reported that Nanny was unwell. No, she isn't, she's just pretending, so the mother had replied. Nanny had bit her lip, finished her day's work, and later confronted 
the mother with the news that she was leaving. Um, you should not have talked like that to me in front of the children, she said. The children had cr cried all night and in the morning the mother was contrite. She had not really meant it. How am I to cope with this next baby, she wailed. You should have thought of that in the first place, said the nanny. Off she sailed without references to land another job in no time. Back on the ward, she smiled, a sad, resigned smile. The strength, the stamina that had kept her through the ups and downs of her illness was that same strength of character that earlier meant she had not been able to know her place. And I think that this is, this is a stage where perhaps uh, with English medicine has got to, where for various reasons, people are simply far less willing to go on feeling ignored um, and that their problems are not important um, as this lady did. And to some extent, doctors, some doctors and medicine are feeling um, rather let down by a situation to which they have tried to do their best. Okay, so um, let me quickly Patient-centred uh, or perhaps person-centred care is now becoming English policy and there have been many efforts now to sort out some of these more obvious problems with care. We have many new structures, we have many new initiatives, some for patient-centred care but as well as all of those for evidence-based medicine that we've been hearing about. Um, I have some unease with this because I'm not sure that the focus is always that precise on patient or person-centred care. And I worry that the stock response that we have to any perceived crisis in healthcare is to propose another reorganisation, another set of structures, <laughs> lots of nods, um, another set of administrative processes to underlie them, and another set of data collection. And this is not going to, it's difficult to see how this is going to help clinicians and others practice better, particularly if they need to manage patients with many more complex problems in less time. I don't have time for a tale in this area, but I just leave you with this reflection from one thing that I wrote which uh, contemplates the tremendous growth that there has been in paper within medical notes. And of course, even if that is now within electronic notes, it doesn't mean that someone has to input it or make sense of it. So my very final reflections are that it's absolutely great and I'm so delighted that patient-centered or person-centered care is gaining ground, both in policy, in evidence and in practice models. But I think we need to um, recognise that some of the key elements are about the time that the same person needs to spend with another person to understand them, to build trust, um, and to be able to say broadly what is going to happen and for that to happen. And clinicians of all kinds need this time to practise it and to teach it and the system needs to be able to allow them to do this as well as they can and also when they fail which inevitably they will at times do. I think coordination in care is a particularly difficult one to solve. At the moment um, my sense is that many clinicians instead of being supported to do this are being perhaps managed into being mini-managers or administrators. And I don't think that we actually know yet what the right structures are and whether ideas like finance or markets can drive this sort of care uh, really have any evidence at all. So my conclusion after this foray back into narrative and history is that I'm now forced back 
into research. Um, and the need for evidence about exactly what are the right cultures, the right structures uh, to support uh, people within this situation. I do know, want to know much more about how often initiatives succeed and fail and how much work they create to justify themselves and how much of the clinician and person time they involve. I'd just like to thank a few people who've helped me along the way and to thank you for listening to me this morning. Thank you. For my timing. Anyway, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and uh, good morning again, everybody. Um, I'm going to make a foray into uh, practice and I'm going to share with you some work that we've been doing over the last uh, 12 months in Cambridge. And um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, two patients who we've looked after. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the team um, who, uh, who work uh, with us. Uh, and in particular, um, look to the values that we uh, aspire to practice in our every day-to-day -day work. And I think it follows on very well from the previous presentations we've had. Because um, when our first speaker was talking, and our second speaker was talking, uh, one of the things that I wrote down was the word resilience. And my question is, how do we build resilient teams uh, of clinicians who can provide sustainable levels of uh, care to patients? And Drossi in particular, I, I'm going to read your book with great care because I felt the objective way in which you were able to describe the environments uh, that we need to have in place to support practice really underpinned other work we know that has been done on, for example, magnet hospitals and in particular how can we promote and support autonomous practice within a supportive environment and um, I'm going to touch on that this morning um, because one of the things I want to say to you all is that the, the individual clinicians that we have working with us in our team all came to work for us because they didn't feel that they could practice in the way that they believed was the right um, environment or in the right way. So we had a, have a self-selected group of clinicians who seek to work uh, in an environment which promotes more autonomy, um, but also um, is, is a high risk um, in terms of, of the need for very careful clinical judgments. And of course, we uh, all know from the presentations that we had yesterday that the place of clinical judgment in practice is absolutely vital in order for us to be able to um, move services forward. Um, and, and, and take a few risks. So um, my objective this morning is to describe the acute home care service which we have established. Um, I want to describe the underpinning values and beliefs of the team, um, our outcomes that we've achieved so far, and I'm going to give two case studies in order to be able to illustrate my, um, my presentation. So um, just picture this, um, we have a team of um, clinicians who are registered nurses, physiotherapists, um, GPs, hospital consultants, uh, rehabilitation assistants, ward clerks, and our very important role, uh, which is Tom, Tom, who's our porter. Uh, and Tom is a person who has a van, um, and he is the person who makes sure that all of our patients who are all in their own homes get the right equipment at the right time and maintain their um, maintain, if you like, the support that they need in their homes from a, from a, a non-clinical perspective. And uh, as you might imagine, all of us who have worked in practice, and we talked about a GP receptionists, um, Tom is often a barometer to us as to uh, whether he might pick up, because we make sure he visits when none of us are there so that we get an extra visit in. He's a great person for saying, I think that somebody needs to pop in and see Mrs. James this afternoon. I don't know what was wrong, she wasn't herself. And and that's all we need to be able to, to build that bit of flexibility in. So I, I named Tom because he's, uh, he's, he's an absolutely superb mem member of our team. Um, I've included GPs and hospital consultants. They're obviously in the day-to-day -day sort of um, community of our, our, our group. Um, they're, they're absolutely fundamental. They're not present in, in our office necessarily, um, but they are a group of uh, people who uh, refer to us on a regular basis and who we have constructed a means of communication using um, both the electronic uh, uh, communication and also phones who themselves, particularly the hospital consultants more than the GPs, have started to learn to work in a very different way uh, with their patients. 
Now, when we uh, started the service, um, we, uh, the organisation started very, very small in about 2002 um, and deliberately didn't grow for a while because, um, you know, when you're providing a, an acute home care service or a unique bespoke service for patients who would otherwise be in hospital, um, it's easier to talk about than it is to get started. And as everything, the devil's in the detail. Um, so we had an awful lot of detail to work through and we had more than one failed service as a result of not putting the detail in place. So once you've burnt your fingers, you learn not to put your hand near the fire and you need to create those controls uh, in order to be able to uh, create the service. But we were absolutely clear that our values were were to, 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 prepare, to provide a person-centred rapid response service and to many of us that was an anathema in itself. How can you be person-centred and rapid? Because actually person-centred, when you talk about it, means we need hours with patients, we need to elicit all of the stuff. Well, we didn't have hours, we didn't have money and we didn't have the time. So we had to make sure that we, if you like, had a microwave where we could cook this, 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 this work very quickly. We wanted to put patients and ca their carers at the heart of the service, provide highest level of clinical care, that goes without stuff that, that says. We also recognise that we have referrers who need to have confidence in our service um, because if they don't, they won't refer to the patient, they won't refer patients to us. Um, so we needed to, to establish with those referrers what they needed in order to be able to refer to our service. And we also believe very strongly as a multidisciplinary team that we need to treat each other and referrers with respect as people. So it comes back to the fact that our team have got rights to work in an environment which supports them in their practice. Um, and um, that's a really important part of, of my role in the leadership of, of, of uh, the service. So we provide two broad pathways and it's the same team that provides care to both groups of patients. The first are patients who, um, if it weren't for the support we were able to provide, would be sent into hospital. And before this service was in place, they did get sent into hospital. Um, and the referrers uh, uh, are GPs or paramedics, um, or uh, in Cambridge there's a service called the Geriatric um, Response Service, which is basically um, a team of therapists who will go and see a patient if a patient dials 999 and the patient is known to the service. Um, and within the um, service, the, 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 the referrers are mainly the GPs. And then we have the early supported discharge service um, and the referrers for this group of patients are consultants within acute hospitals. Um, and um, when we assess the patients, we assess the hospital referrals in the hospital setting and with the uh, patients who get referred to us by GPs, we respond within two hours um, and go to see the patient in their own home. Um, and I'll talk in a bit more detail about that. In terms of clinical responsibility from a medical perspective, um, the overall clinical responsibility with the admission avoidance team of the GPs, and for those who are um, in the early supported discharge team, it's the consultant, because these patients remain uh, under the care of the hospital. They actually remain on the hospital patient administration system, and they are, in a, it, it, they are inpatients uh, for anything uh, in terms of for, for their coding and everything else. Um, and that works extremely well. The GP um, delivering the care plan, the, G the GP assesses the patient. If the patient's referred to us by a paramedic, then the GP has to review the patient within 24 hours to confirm the care plan. Um, the GP prescribes um, and the community pharmaceutical services do, do this, dispense with many drugs. And then if there is a need for any pathology, that's managed in the usual primary care way. Uh, in the uh, early supported discharge service, the hospital um, uh, provides all of the medicines um, and any kind of uh, uh, pathology is managed through the hospital and then ongoing review is undertaken by GPs consultants uh, mainly by email or by reviewing our electronic patient record. So the admission avoidance service is uh, referral by GPs and paramedics. We accept referrals from 8am to 8pm seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, and as I said, we do a home assessment within two hours of referral and the assessment is done by a registered nurse and a therapist unless the patient is being referred purely because uh, they're frail and we think um, actually the lead clinician will be a therapist in this case and then one of our OTs or one of our physios will go and see the patient. Um, we're able to provide equipment, get medication, all within 
um, a few hours of uh, seeing the patient and then we agree with the patient and with the, the referrer um, what level of support the patient will need and I'll talk a bit about that when I give the case studies and care commences immediately after uh, the first visit. So um, this uh, case study, I chose this lady because um, it was a classic example of where acute uh, interventions by a community home care team, I believe, and the patient believed, and the GP believed, really made a difference in avoiding a breakdown in um, uh, providing care for, for this uh, couple. Um, so the uh, lady was uh, an 85 year old and of course the services in Cambridge, she's a retired academic but she's also the main carer of her husband who has dementia and the GP was called by their cleaner who uh, thought that uh, the, pa the patient, the lady was unwell and she was a bit confused and she'd never noticed that before. When the GP did the home visit, di he diagnosed that she had a urinary tract infection um, and she was mildly dehydrated. She was also exhausted, you know, she's, she was a main carer of her husband. So the patient was referred to us for assessment and uh, then uh, the GP asked us to, to, to decide what we felt was the right package of care for both of them. Now, the truth of the matter is that if we weren't in place, then social services wouldn't have been able to mobilise any support for at least three days. So the GP was very clear, because we have a very clear audit, that these patients are patients who would have been admitted to hospital uh, because, the, if you like, the danger, and going back to Salman's point about money, is one of the, the, the dangers of establishing services like this is that we just meet unmet need rather than genuinely avoid admissions to hospitals. So, uh, you know, we have to be very careful about the fact that uh, uh, we, we, the patients that we're, we're reviewing are, 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 are chosen, chosen well. And um, this uh, lady was, um, we, ref we received the referral at 11 a.m. Uh, we did a visit, one of our RNs and the occupational therapist went to see her. Um, they assessed uh, the patient and they uh, produced a plan of care which uh, included reablement goals both for, for, both for the patient and for her uh, husband. So of course the issue for us was the care was not just about the individual who was referred to us, it was about the, the other, uh, others in the home and managing a supportive environment to make sure both of them were safe um, in, 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 in the care. So um, the husband, his, her husband was very concerned to support his wife so the joint plan was agreed and the needs of both partners included in the plan and as a result of that and um, the, the, the patient who had been referred to us was very angry and very tense when we arrived because she was terrified that we were going to make her go to hospital and as soon as we were able to, uh, but because she was a bright intelligent academic she wanted to know what the options were and so we uh, described that worked with her and she agreed to allow the package of care to commence and you know her physical uh, example of how she uh, demonstrated agreement she just went to bed <laughs> she felt she could just go to bed and go and have a sleep in the afternoon um, so our, our plan and our, our, our is was that Four times a day we uh, provided our rehab assistants. Um, it's interesting that we have five rehab assistants working with the Cambridge team. Four of them are qualified sports therapists. Um, they very much work with our, our uh, rehabilitation, our, our, our therapists. Um, and so uh, we know that the, 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 the therapy that we are prescribing is going to be carried on at each of the visits. Um, they were, went in and, uh, four times a day to provide uh, activity of daily living support for both the husband and the wife, including shopping and keeping the husband in his routine, which occasionally meant taking him to the day centre where he used to go once a week. The patient had been prescribed um, 48 hours of IV antibiotics, so of course the RNs um, cannulated the, pa the patient and were able to provide that, uh, uh, that, uh, that care for the patient. And they uh, implemented a sort of rehydration plan because she was uh, quite dehydrated, so we were very focused on that for the first uh, 24 hours or so. And the focus was on reablement. So the objectives that we set with, with both, both, both of them were about, uh, you know, managing to, to, to get over this and actually be in a better place than before we started. And our OT, our occupational therapist, was able to work with her husband to provide some activities which he hadn't been doing before, which he really enjoyed and which took a lot of the worry away that he had of the disruption, if you like, in the dynamic equilibrium of that household, if we think of the systems theories that we were talking about with Joachim yesterday. The lady, of course, a few shots of IV antibiotics, her, her UTI uh, improved, she was more hydrated, so she 
began to improve quite uh, dramatically over the 24 hours. She was reviewed twice uh, by the GP, just who wanted to make sure things were all right, and we reduced her visits to three times a day uh, on day three. Um, and then the uh, RN visits were withdrawn um, as soon as the uh, IVs had finished because we felt the OT was the appropriate lead clinician in this case to carry on the package of care to the end. We reduced the packages of care to both of them and by day five um, the, both, both of them had achieved their goals. There was equilibrium in the household and the, the patient really felt um, uh, that, 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 that she was able to move forward uh, with things as uh, as they were. So the outcomes are quite clear. The patient remained at home instead of being admitted to hospital. The patient's husband remained at home because he would have had to have some respite care at least. Um, at the very best they might have provided some support at home but actually he, he, he was, uh, he was, um, sorry, that was just. And what was really interesting is that the wife kept a journal of her experience after day two um, and might expect that anyway as a sort of an English academic. Um, and she gave that to the team on day five as a gift. She wanted to write about how her experience of our service had helped her to remain with her husband. And it was a wonderful gift. And we keep that in our office, actually, for, uh, for, uh, for, page, for, for staff to read. Um, and she also documented her progress in the clinical record as well. So we discharged the patient. We uh, uh, provide a discharge summary for her GP. Um, and uh, we uh, file our records in the normal way, and that's the sort of routine way of how, how we do it. The early supportive discharge service, I described that um, basically patients are in patients but in their own home. Um, and uh, the service provides a lot of intravenous IV drugs, we provide dressings. These are all the tasks we do for the persons that we care for, so forgive me that I'm not talking in a particularly person-centred way. And I have to say that if I was being really person-centred, it wouldn't be me making the presentation, but it would be uh, a video of the patient, but I didn't have time to do that. Um, and so we deal with a, a lot of patients who would otherwise be in hospital. I'm not going to talk about that. I've talked about the delivery, but I'm going to talk about this case study. This is a 45-year-old lady. She's married, mother of four children. She was diagnosed with a very large uh, pleural tumour uh, following uh, a community-managed uh, episode of pneumonia. Um, the multidisciplinary team discussed treatment options, and she agreed to the surgical removal of the tumour. But when they were discussing the treatment options, it became clear that the patient's main concern and focus were her young children and her husband. So um, we were called in to build a care plan, which allowed rapid transfer home following her surgery. The uh, patient had a strong Christian faith and wished to meet with the chaplain prior to surgery. She wanted information about how she might contribute to her own uh, post-operative recovery. In fact, in the week between the decision to operate and her surgery, uh, she saw a personal trainer who helped. It was very interesting, the little things. And the big thing the personal trainer helped her to do is to practice standing up um, from a chair um, in order for her to be able to transfer from the bed and to the chair after her surgery, which I thought was quite a good skill and worked out to being a very important thing for her to learn to do. The clinical nurse specialist and physio spent time educating her preoperatively, and by the time of the day of surgery arrived, she was very focused uh, to meet her goals she set jointly with the clinical team. So the case study uh, is this lady three days post thoracotomy and removal of her pleural tumour. Uh, her chest drains and epidural were removed at this stage. She was controlled uh, from an analgesic perspective with oxycodone and oxycontin, which are, I have to tell you, the most wonderful analgesic I've ever come across ever. Um, she was eating and drinking, mobilising with the support of one nurse, and she was desperate to go home to her children. So we're talking about day three post thoracotomy, not bad, I think, actually. Um, so the consultant was happy. Well, he was happy, but he said, I'm like this, because he'd never, never allowed this to happen before. Um, so he knew that uh, the transfer conditions from his perspective were four times a day visits, full observations, including oximetry, medicines management and education, wound care, daily bloods for three more days for UNE's inflammatory markers and full blood count, and daily emails to him with a full report at 4 p.m. and contact PRM. So we knew that we had direct access, we were able to communicate with him, and he was very diligent. He did read his emails at four o'clock every day because he was so interested and concerned about this service. She was transferred home. One of our nurses came to see her late, an hour later, happy and pain-free, did a full examination, and the care plan was discussed with the patient, the husband, the two of the four children, and the dog, all on the sofa together, and uh, all understood how to summon assistant med storage and management. 
So by day four, which was the day after discharge home, four visits happened. Um, she became a bit constipated. The surgeon was happy with progress. The GP did a visit um, because he said, I just have to see this for myself and uh, assured himself that the notification of the discharge were true because he didn't believe it when he got it because it was only day four. Um, and he'd been very involved in case managing her uh, through the preoperative phase of her illness. And by day five, four visits were made by the RN plus a visit. visit and the progress was maintained, the patient went out for a walk, and I have to say the other thing the patient did was put the washing in the washing machine, which I don't think, again, is bad therapy post uh, five days post thoracotomy, but that was down to the oxycontin, I think. Um, day six, the visits were reduced to three a day, uh, physio was no longer required, um, and um, then they, we reduced it down to twice daily because she just didn't think she needed those days. And by day seven, um, we reduced the visits to daily for three more days, sutures were removed, and by day 10, the clips were removed, wound was left exposed. For, we were photographing the wound and sent the information to the physician, and the patient was discharged and followed up in clinic afterwards. So the outcome was, the patient was very happy to be home with her husband and children. She was discharged from hospital five days before identical cases. The children were reassured to have mum home, as was the dog, and I have to say the husband, and person-centered care reduced, in this case distressed, uh, improved clinical outcome and saved money. So this was something we felt was really important. Um, I thought I'd introduce you to the patient. She's a person, her name is Helen, and actually she's my wife, and it was a personal story that I'm sharing with you here. But actually it was an amazing, um, I wasn't involved clinically in her care, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, I know it works. Uh, so, and that's, those are the two of the children. Thank you.